So good afternoon, everyone. I'm very happy to be able to welcome you to the 100th Kampuszynski Development Lecture. These lectures are uh, co-funded by the European Commission and the UNDP, and they are hosted at different universities around Europe, and we are uh, the lucky ones to have been um, granted the possibility to host the 100th. I'm not going to start with any introductions at the moment. I first want to give the floor to uh, the UNDP representative who is here today, Karen Cirillo. Uh, Karen, please. Hello. Oh, that's very loud. Thank you all for coming. Um, I am very honored to be here today to introduce this Kapuczynski Lecture at Maastricht University. Um, as she said, this is uh, the 100th lecture that we have been putting on. We started in 2009, and um, the lecture series brings prominent speakers of our time to universities across Europe to discuss important issues facing the world. Um, together, UNDP and the European Commission, who we thank very much for their support uh, in this initiative, being our partners, have brought 100 lectures since 2009 attended and watched by over 130,000 people from Europe and around the world. Um, the lecture series is actually named for Richard Kapuczynski, who is a Polish journalist and writer, and he famously described developing countries around the world and was known for his focus on the poor and those that are left behind. So we try to focus the Capuchinci lectures on issues of development and issues facing our world today. Um, the lectures bring something important and relevant to the table, and they provide educational opportunities for students to hear experts on these topics that are affecting our interconnected globe and to discuss and debate with the speakers their perspectives. So we very much thank Elchinda Hanwara for being here with us, and the introductions will continue. Thank you all for coming. So welcome again. My name is Valentina Mazzucato, and I'm professor of globalization and development here at the Maastricht University. Um, it is a great pleasure to be able to welcome Professor Alcinda Hanwana to the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences of Maastricht University and to have her deliver the 100th Kapuscinski Lecture. This is a great pleasure not only because Kapuscinski happens to be one of my favorite authors, but also, and especially, because Professor Honwana is an eminent scholar on youth. And her work is used in our teaching, and it inspires some of our research that's looking at, into the predicament of global youth, their futures, their aspirations, and the hurdles that they encounter in contemporary societies, both in the global north as well as in the global south. And I would also like to thank the UNDP and the European Commission for co-funding this event. As always, such events are group work, and I would also and especially like to thank Bilisu Madito, who I've just asked to step out for a moment <laughs> to get some water, who, um, who was actually co-author in the grant application to uh, apply for this, uh, this hosting this Kapuscinski lecture here, but also to Merle Sana and Elaine from our project office, to Margot from the PR office, and last but not least, to the students who did all of the running around and arranging. So, Mattia, Olga, Rian, Jonas, and Leonard, thank you. Professor Honwana currently works at the United Nations Department of Social and Economic Affairs. Before that, she held the chair in the international development at uh, the Open University in the UK, where she also directed the Center for International Development. She was also program director at the Social Sciences Research Council in New York and taught anthropology in the New School of Social Research in New York, as well as at the University of Cape Town. Now, Professor Honwana's uh, lecture today is entitled Youth in Movement, Weighthood, Migration, and the Peripheries. And in a way, it's quite appropriate that we're hosting this lecture in one of the, or the oldest gymnasium hall in the Netherlands, this room right here that you're sitting in, um, where in the past hundreds of young people swung from the ceilings of this room and did their impressive turns and flips uh, on turnstiles and on beams. 
Professor Hunwana brings us today her knowledge and stories amassed over dec her decades of uh, long research on youth, and who I will argue later also engage in flips and turns, um, but in a different way. One of her well-known books was on child soldiers in Africa. Through studying child soldiers, soldiers' social and economic transitions into adult independence, she came to the wider notion of weighthood, a state between childhood and adulthood in which youth negotiate a state of not being children anymore, but also not being able to enter into social adulthood due to deficient education or a lack of job opportunities. I say that this is a wider notion of weighthood because this state is not only applicable to extreme situations such as child soldiers uh, in Africa, but actually to a much more general condition amongst youth in Africa as she demonstrates in her book, The Time of Youth, published in 2012, based on a study of Mozambican, South African, Senegalese, and Tunisian youth. She documents young people grappling with the contradictions um, of modernity in which opportunities and expectations simultaneously broaden, but at the same time become more constrained. So while the notion of weighthood might conjure a state of passivity, simply waiting to become an adult, I would say that the crux of Professor Honwana's work is precisely in showing the diverse strategies, the flips and the turns, that youth employ to navigate weighthood and to try to exit this state. What's interesting to me as a scholar of transnational youth, that is youth who have a migrant background and are mobile between their home countries and the countries where they reside, is to explore how transitions into adulthood for such youth in North America or in Europe may also be characterized by the notion of weighthood. Certainly, the concept has been useful to some of our master's students who did their theses in looking at the conditions of asylum seekers here in the Maastricht area. So, without further ado, I would like to welcome Professor Honwana to give us her lecture on youth and movement. Welcome, Professor. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I would like to start by thanking the United Nations Development Program, the European Commission, and Maastricht University for inviting me to deliver the Kapuczynski Development Lecture. I'm proud to join the impressive list of individuals that over the years have presented Kapuczynski developed lectures around Europe. I thank Ms. Karen Cirillo for the, from UNDP for introducing this event. And I thank Professor Valentina Mazzucato for the generous introduction, but also for helping organize my visit to Maastricht University. And I'm grateful to all of you for your presence here this afternoon. Thank you for coming. The views that I express, or I will express in this presentation, are my own, and they do not reflect in any way the views of the United Nations. Richard Kapuczynski left a legacy of insightful, captivating narratives about people in the periphery across the world. Kapuczynski had an extraordinary ability to listen and empathize with people and an insatiable and deep curiosity about the lives and the predicaments of those for whom poverty, violence, and lack of fundamental freedoms was commonplace. His writings painted remarkable portraits of places, peoples, cultures, and human encounters. While he has been criticized for making some implausible generalizations about Africa and Africans, 
There is no doubt that Kapuczynski trailed unbeaten paths to report on coups, revolutions, disasters, and other challenging world events, including the wars in Angola and in my own country, Mozambique. Kapuczynski's narratives strived to depict the incredible diversity and the humanity he encountered in his travels across the world. In his own words, and I quote, my main ambition is to show Europeans that our mentality is very Eurocentric, that Europe, or rather its part, is not the only one in the world, end of quote. Kapuczynski was indeed a man enamored with the world and its peripheries, and a passionate advocate for development and equity for all. In the spirit of Kapuczynski's narratives, my lecture this afternoon will focus on young people in the periphery, those from Africa and from marginalized youth in Europe, who are struggling to make a life for themselves and becoming fully fledged members of society. These young people see themselves as the disadvantaged, the excluded, and the destitute in their own societies and in the world. The world has never been so young, with about 1.8 billion between the ages of 10 and 24. Most of them live in the developing countries. But young people's transitions to adult life have become increasingly uncertain. In Africa, but also in Europe and other parts of the globe, a growing number of young women and young men, both educated and non-educated, find themselves unemployed or underemployed and they must improvise livelihoods outside of dominant economic and social frameworks. Young, these young people are living in the periphery of major socioeconomic processes and have lost trust in the ability of their governments to deliver on their needs and expectations. So in this lecture, I will develop three main arguments. First, that the vast majority of young people in Africa are living in what I refer to as weighthood, a prolonged, difficult, but also dynamic transition into adult life. Weighthood is also this liminal space in which young people are neither dependent children nor autonomous adults. But weighthood isn't just an African experience. Young people in Europe also grapple with protracted transitions to adulthood, including joblessness and political exclusion. I'll discuss weighthood and the ways in which it is manifested both in Africa and in Europe. My second argument is that young people are responding to the pressures of weighthood in multiple ways. And migration, both internal and international, is one such response. Young people migrate in search of better opportunities and better futures. Central here is that young people lack basic opportunities to make it at home, an availability of jobs and sustainable livelihoods, as well as the absence of political and social freedoms. The realities of their daily lives expose the gap between the promise of fairness, individual freedom and prosperity, and their existence of marginalization and lack of opportunities. Third, I argue that while youth migration has become in the past few years 
a central issue in the relationship between Europe and Africa. The approaches taken to address the problem have been insufficient. The emphasis on policing and border controls have overshadowed the need to address the root causes of migration. Both European and African leaders will have to recognize the historicity, the nature, and the broader context of international migration in order to develop effective cooperation that is beneficial to both Europe and Africa. My analysis is based on in-depth interviews I conducted with young people in various African contexts, which resulted in my two latest books, The Time of Youth, Work, Social Change, and Politics in Africa, published in 2012, and Youth and Revolution in Tunisia, published in 2013. This analysis is also informed by my reading of youth transitions, job joblessness, and migration flows, uh, flows in Europe and across the globe. In Africa, young people constitute the disenfranchised majority living in weighthood. Whatever their class background, many youths have no secure jobs and cannot afford to establish families and set up their own households. The ability to work and provide for themselves and for others defines a person's self-worth and position in the family and in the community, and therefore constitutes an important marker of adulthood. The experiences of weighthood among young people differ by class, gender, and level of education. Men, for example, face the pressures of getting a steady job finding a home, and covering the costs of marriage and family building. Although women are becoming better educated and have always engaged in productive labor alongside household chores, marriage and motherhood are still important markers of adulthood. While giving birth may provide girls with an entry into adulthood, their ability to attain full adulthood status often depends on men moving beyond weighthood. Middle class youths with stronger socioeconomic and political connections may experience weighthood differently. In Mozambique, in the past, Becoming a labor migrant in the South African mines constituted a rite of passage into adulthood. As exploitative as the South African mining sector might have been, these jobs helped young Mozambicans to become husbands, fathers, and providers for their families, and in turn allowed young women to become wives mothers, and homemakers. Similarly, getting a university degree guaranteed access to jobs and upward mobility for new graduates. Today, however, African societies do not offer reliable pathways into adulthood. Jobs such as the mining ones are gone, and a university degree does not necessarily lead to decent employment. Indeed, traditional ways of making this transition have broken down, and the new ways of attaining adult status are yet to be developed. However, the young are not merely waiting and hoping that their situation will change of its own accord. Waitwood is propelling young people to be creative and improvise livelihoods outside of dominant economic and familiar frameworks. Young people in Waitwood 
are creating new dynamic sites for inventiveness and survival. From interviews with young people in my book, The Time of Youth, I describe the extemporaneous and precarious nature of their lives in Waithood. Young Mozambicans use the Portuguese expression, desenrascar a vida, which means to hick out a living. Young Senegalese and Tunisians use the French word debrouillage, making do. And the young South, Africa's, South Africans just said, we are just getting by. The idea of desenrascar a vida, debrouillage, or getting by, situates the Waithood experience in the realm of improvisation of making it up as you go along. And it entails a conscious effort to assess challenges and possibilities. Young Africans discover and invent new ways of existing in the margins of society. This is the experience of many young women and men who engage in street vending, cross-border trading and smuggling, those who migrate illegally to South Africa, to Kenya, or to Europe and America, and those who end up in criminal networks as swindlers, traffickers, and gangsters. Young women and men often see little option but to also use their sexuality as means of gaining a livelihood. They engage in intimate and often exploitative relationships with wealthy and powerful men and women, commonly known as sugar daddies and sugar mamas, for money, gifts, and access to fashionable goods. Some young people become successful entrepreneurs. Depending on their gender, they have taken up activities such as repairing electronic devices, making and marketing clothing and jewelry, and doing hair and nails. Others are creating new artistic, musical, and performance forms, making graffiti, painting murals, writing blogs, and becoming savvy internet users. Unemployed and underemployed graduates are taking up jobs usually performed by less educated youth. Meager's work shows that the shrinking formal economy in northern Nigeria, for example, is driving more educated people into the informal market. That, in turn, pushes out the less educated and leaves them more vulnerable for recruitment by Boko Haram or other violent groups and networks. Ibrahim Abdallah and Abubakar Momo have pointed out to the use of the vernacular term youth man. In many West African countries, which describes the large and increasing number of unemployed 35-year-olds and older who are struggling to attain social adulthood. But waithood also represents a period of political marginalization, which deprives young people of the space for political engagement liberty of expression, and other civil liberties. Young people complain about political repression, social injustice, humiliation, and loss of dignity and freedom. The concept of waithood can also be applied in the Western context where in the past decades, young people have increasingly struggled with their transition into adult life. Life course scholars have pointed out that in Europe, youth transitions have become prolonged as young people stay in school longer, obtain their first jobs late, and start families much later. 
youth transitions have moved away from traditionally predetermined patterns to become more decentralized, destandardized, individualized and fragmented and without clear-cut trajectories. Expressions such as the boomerang generation or the yo-yo generation have been used to depict young women and men who return home and continue to depend on their parents after graduating from university. In Italy, for example, bambuccioni, or big dummy boys, is an expression that mocks the growing number of unmarried young men in their mid-20s or 30s who are still living with their parents. In Portugal, a geração arrasca denotes the besieged generation with no future prospects. And in Japan, Parasaito Shinguru, or Parasite Singles, refers to the growing number of young Japanese who are unable to enter the labor market and begin their own families. In the past, youth transitions have been seen as a move from dependency to autonomy. And thus, the experiences of these young people today could be regarded as failed transitions. However, the notion of failed transitions is a flawed one because it remains attached to a view of transitions that is linear and unidirectional. It also places the blame on young people themselves rather than on the system that is failing them. The lives of young people in today's world cannot be reduced to a simple dichotomy between dependency and autonomy. Today's transitions are more complex and they fluctuate between dependency, semi-dependency, autonomy, or even concurrent dependency and autonomy experiences. Young Europeans have been the most affected by the 2008 economic downturn. Being young, motivated, and well-educated no longer means being on the path to independence. Youth unemployment rates in Europe have increased steadily since the onset of the economic crisis. According to Eurostat, in 2013, in average, 25% young Europeans were unemployed, with large variations between member states showing rates as high as 50% in southern European countries and recent 2017 figures still keep unemployment rates in Europe, particularly in these countries, at 35 to 45%. The social reality of increased unemployment and its consequences means that more young people in the West find themselves in waithood and can no longer live according to the societal standards for material and social well-being. While those with higher social and economic status may cope more easily with the pressures of weighthood, those with restricted resources and opportunities suffer from the same burdens of débrouillage and making do like their African counterparts. Indeed, the situation is a lot more difficult for young people from poor, working class, and immigrant families in the developed world who lack access to quality education, to prospects of regular employment, and secure livelihoods. A study by MacDonald and March among youths in poor neighborhoods in Britain showed that opportunities are still strongly influenced by the individual's original location in the class structure. The study revealed the 
pervasive deprivation, unemployment, and hardship in working class and Im immigrant com communities in Britain. Gender, race, and class disadvantages compound one another, and those young people remain caught in a downward spiral of stagnation and exclusion. According to several studies, the problems leading to disadvantage take place at various points in young people's transitions, such as leaving compulsory schooling early or without qualifications, or lack of access to training, or the mismatch between qualification and labor market needs or lack of entry routes into labor markets, loss of housing security, or, may, or even limited citizenship. All these barriers to social inclusion are produced and reproduced by individual, structural, and institutional deficits. In the United States, Young African Americans and Latinos are less likely to graduate high school and go on to college than their white counterparts. Even with similar levels of education, they have far greater difficulty finding employment. Young black and Latino youths are thus trapped in a social environment of systemic failure. Life course scholars have been using terms such as young adults or adult lessons to better capture this prolonged and intermittent nature of current tra transitions in the West. Indeed, the meaning of young adults or adult adolescents is very similar to the West African notion of youth men. Certainly, it appears that disadvantaged young Europeans from working class and immigrant communities may have more in common with young Africans in Waithwood rather than the European middle class counterparts who might have a different experience of weighthood. Like them, they too feel that they have no stake in society. Nevertheless, the adversities experienced by young Europeans represent just one side of the coin. Young Europeans in Waitwood are creatively reshaping their lives amidst adversity by reinterpreting, tackling, and transforming the conditions of uncertainty in their lives. Indeed, like their African counterparts, young women and men in Europe negotiate and create new structures, spaces, and lifestyles to resourcefully respond to the structural conditions created by labor markets, bureaucracies, and the state. They also renegotiate their relationship with the family at the same time as families themselves adjust and restructure their relational codes vis-a-vis -vis their own offspring. Migration has been an important reaction to weighthood. For many young people, migration is not only a coping mechanism to escape poverty, joblessness, and lack of freedom, but it's rather an opportunity to gain a sense of pride, of dignity and self-worth, and to be viewed as accomplished individuals by their families and communities. Young people perceive migration to be a pathway to improve their status and to gain upward economic and social mobility. Young Africans in Waitwood with no prospects of a decent future often leave their rural villages in search of opportunities in the cities. 
The story of Sangare, a young man from a rural village in southern Mali, who decides to leave his impoverished village to try and find stable employment in Bamako illustrates this predicament. Sangare finds in Bamako an unrewarding and precarious reality that leads him from small job to small job, selling sunglasses, shining shoes, or driving a rickshaw. The inability to find stable employment in Bamako forced Sangaret to migrate. Rural exodus confronts many young Africans with few employment opportunities and weak support networks in already overcrowded urban areas. The situation is even worse for young women as they face employment barriers, ending up in exploitative jobs as maids, cleaners, servants, and prostitutes. Some of these rural youths, youth migrants, they join the ranks of their urban counterparts in trying to find better opportunities outside of their own countries. While international migration of young Africans toward Europe has increased in the past few years, the larger youth migration story and much less reported remains inside the continent. As stated by the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, 80% of Africans who migrate do so inside of the continent. Only 15 to 20% of migrants take the route to Europe or to the West. Africa is indeed the major host of interregional migration, with South Africa and Kenya being major recipients of migrant populations from within the country, or from within the continent. In South Africa, the rise of African immigration, for example, has triggered atrocities uh, of uh, xenophobic, xenophobic violence in 2008 and 2015, when South Africans' poorest attacked African migrants living and working in the country. These attacks stressed the failure of the post-apartheid regime in addressing the inequalities of the past and creating jobs for the black population. And this has instigated horrendous victim-on-victim -victim violence. In the past few years, there have been numerous media, media reports with disturbing images of hundreds of desperate young Africans crowded shoulder to shoulder in rickety boats sailing, sailing towards an unknown future in Europe. The long journey starts in their countries, mainly in West Africa and the Horn, through the desert towards North Africa, where they make the perilous crossing to Europe, hoping and dreaming of a better life. The fatalities are high. Yet, many continue to depart on similar journeys in a daily basis. These young migrants pay large sums of money and travel for days under harsh weather conditions, suffering abuse from smugglers and criminal networks. A good number get stranded in transit countries, and there have been recent reports that reveal gross human rights violations of African uh, migrants transiting through countries like Libya, and many of them are tortured, raped, and enslaved by human traffickers and criminal syndicates. Those who survive the crossing to Europe are placed in overcrowded intake shelters. In September 2016, 
Europe started the hotspot system at key points of arrival in Italy and Greece, a strategy aimed at employing more efficient screening to distinguish migrants between asylum seekers and economic migrants. However, the, the distinction between economic migrant and asylum seeker is challenging and not always clear cut. Economic migrant is not a legal category, but an umbrella term to refer to people that move from one country to another to advance their economic and professional prospects. And asylum seekers, on the other hand, refers to those who are considered eligible to apply for asylum or who have already applied and are awaiting a decision. While some have called the distinction necessary at times of unprecedented human movement, Others have considered it a violation of human rights and the dehumanization of one group in favor of the other. Under the 1951 Geneva Conventions relating to the status of refugees, while not all immigrants might be eligible for asylum, all migrants have the right to apply to asylum and have their asylum claim reviewed. This is a basic human right. The hotspot system has been criticized by migrant rights groups as a system to essentially exclude the so-called economic migrants from applying for asylum in Europe. Indeed, European leaders have suggesting installing hotspots within Africa, particularly in Chad and Niger, to prevent migrants from leaving the continent if they wouldn't make the eligible list. Even some of those who are considered eligible for asylum believe that the hotspot system in, in some ways violates their rights. For example, Sami, a 20-year-old potential asylum seeker from Eritrea stuck in Lampedusa, has been refusing to give his fingerprints to the Italian authorities. Sami wants to join his family in the UK and doesn't want to relocate to just any other European country. According to the EU's Dublin regulation, the country that takes the seeker's fingerprints is responsible for processing their asylum claim, preventing them from claiming asylum in the country of their choice. A large proportion of the estimated 6,000 migrants who entered Italy in the first half of 2016 were considered economic migrants and they were handed refusal of entry. Repatriations have been difficult due to failed implementation agreements and also due to the fact that many migrants burn their national documents before making the trip. So those considered to be economic migrants are given seven days to leave the European Union by their own means. And most go underground or move to other European nations some making a living through precarious jobs, mainly in the informal agriculture and construction. But the migration story also happens in another direction, the less reported north-south migration by young Europeans that illustrates the growth of weight wood in northern countries. Young people who are unable to find jobs in Europe have been migrating to the global south. 
a report by the International Organization of Migration stated that hundreds of thousands of young Europeans, predominantly from France, Italy, Spain, and Portugal, are migrating to Latin America and Africa. A large number of young women and young men from Portugal have moved to Angola and Mozambique. And most are single, well-educated, and aged between 25 and 30. Anna, a 28-year-old Portuguese woman with a master's degree in economics, explained that she couldn't get a job in Portugal and decided to migrate to Mozambique. I interviewed Anna in Maputo in 2014. She is one of the 480,000 Portuguese nationals who migrated to Mozambique between 2011 and 2014 in search of jobs. This migratory movement has been encouraged by the Portuguese government. In 2011, Portugal's Prime Minister urged the young and unemployed to find jobs overseas and to use their uh, energy and creativity to travel abroad and try to make it there. With European, fun European Union funding, the Inov Contacto program funds young graduates training and temporary internships in Portuguese companies operating abroad. Candidates must be unemployed under 30 years of age and hold a higher degree in any field of study. The program covers cost of travel and a six month stipend with no costs for the host company during that period. The ultimate goal is to have the interns settle in jobs abroad, either by being absorbed by the host company or finding other jobs in those countries. Despite the company's clear preference for Portuguese graduates, their absorption into the companies after the six-month internship has not always been easy. Mozambique, for example, imposes tight labor rules for foreign companies operating in the country, requiring them to hire a certain number of nationals for each foreign employee. Some companies managed to get around this rule, and Anna, my interviewee, explains how. And I quote what she said. After my six-month internship, the Portuguese, Portuguese company wanted to hire me full-time, but they couldn't afford to hire more Mozambicans. So they suggested that I create my own company so that they could hire me as a service provider and not as an employee. And so I did, and since then I've been working with them for four years now. Socially, the young Portuguese tend to find support and interact among themselves within the Portuguese expatriate community in Mozambique. Pedro, a young Portuguese who also moved to Mozambique through the government internship program, said that he doesn't have many Mozambican friends despite living in the country for four years. And he says, and I quote, I rent a room with a share, in a shared apartment with three other Portuguese friends of mine, and we lean on each other for support, end of quote. Maria, another Portuguese woman I interview, who also arrived in Mozambique in 2011 by her own means, she said that they have an email support group and that they can often, they get often contacted by other fellow Portuguese who are still in Europe and want to make the journey to the south. And she says, and I quote, 
Every day, there is another CV from Portugal, someone else looking for a job and wanting to come here, end of quote. These Portuguese economic migrants rely on their own networks and appear to have very limited interaction with Mozambicans of their own age. While their presence in Mozambique is tolerated, some young Mozambicans I interviewed resent the fact that the Portuguese migrants are taking up jobs that could be performed by nationals, heightening weight wood among educated young Mozambicans. While there are similarities regarding the reasons that make young people to migrate from Africa to Europe or vice versa, their migration experiences couldn't be more strikingly different. On the one hand, the perilous and often deadly boat crossings in the Mediterranean loaded with hopeful Africans who, if not dead, end up in overcrowded shelters awaiting screening. And on the other hand, the modern jets of hope, full of hopeful Portuguese graduates holding visas, a government stipend, an internship in a, a secure internship in a company, and the shared accommodation in a nice neighborhood in Maputo. The irony is that these young Portuguese economic migrants, like many other Europeans fleeing high unemployment rates at home, are in fact exacerbating the crisis in the South. In the past decade, the relationship between Europe and Africa has been centered on the issue of migration. The policy agendas that guided Europe-Africa summits since the 2015 in Valletta focused on how to curb irregular migration. The 2016 EU Migration Partnership Framework formally incorporated migration policy into the European Union's foreign policy. Under this framework, the European Union established migration compacts with key countries in Africa. While the European Union Emergency Trust Fund for Africa of 2015 is putting resources towards social economic programs to help create better jobs in Africa, support deportees reintegration, and strengthen education about the perils of irregular migration, the bulk of European resources have been channeled to security programs aimed at improving border controls and boosting police crackdowns on migrants as well as on human smuggling and trafficking networks. This money for migration strategy has not always produced the desirable outcomes. The government of Mali, for example, ended up withdrawing from a deal to receive 145 million euros for accepting repatriations of Malians uh, that were illegal in Europe and to strengthen border security. And this was due to a public outcry in the country and the motion of censor that came from the Malian parliament against this policy. Moreover, Chad and Niger's refusal to host hotspots for migrant screenings in their borders also signals African countries' unwillingness to inherit Europe's problems of control of migration flaws and dealing with deportations and repatriations of non-eligible asylum seekers. In 2017, Europe 
and African summit that the Europe and African summit that took place in Abidjan proposed to reset the button as both Europe and Africa realized the need for a fresh start. Tackling symptoms of migration was not enough as the problem must be addressed at its roots. That is why the Abidjan summit focused on investing in youth for a sustainable future rather ju than just irregular migration. The European Fund for Sustainable Development, the centerpiece of the EU new external investment plan, has been set up to develop policies and programs more conducive to sustainable African development. Analysts suggest that this is the best way forward in tackling such a complex issue. The problem is certainly much larger than migration per se and needs to be addressed within the broader framework of economic growth and sustainable development and social inclusion, social justice, and political freedoms. Most of the young Africans I interviewed during my research appear to have lost faith in the ability of their leaders to respond to their needs and aspirations. They also understand that their weighthood situation results from domestic corruption and poor governance, coupled with a global system that makes inequality and social injustice possible at home. Young Africans are becoming increasingly aware of the alignment between local and global forces and the limited capacity of African states to uphold the social contract with their citizenry. So, when young people knock at the doors of Europe, they are really saying to European leaders, and I quote what a few young men and women have told me, we are your problem too. European and African governments need to be cognizant of the historicity, the nature, and the broader context of international migration in order to develop effective cooperation. Migration is beneficial to both an aging Europe and a rapidly developing Africa. Supporting Africa also meets Europe's economic and political interests because of the genuine opportunities that Africa offers. Africa has critical raw materials essential to European industries, and most of its economies are growing at high rates. Investing in Africa is not only a matter of funding, but also the transfer of skills and empowerment of public and private institutions to design, execute, and monitor effective development programs. Achieving sustainable development in Africa may reduce irregular migration flaws. But as many analysts have stressed, it will also inspire people to migrate legally. Therefore, investing in the empowerment of Africa is investing in the future of both Africa and Europe. And I thank you very much for listening.
Thank you, Honwana, for um, Professor Honwana, for this inspiring uh, lecture and also one that touched upon so many aspects, um, starting from your work on weighthood and very specific to Africa, moving all the way over to drawing some parallels between weighthood, youth in weighthood in Africa to youth in weighthood uh, in Europe, and, um, and then ending with this um, analysis of the current uh, situation uh, of migration. And I especially also enjoyed you highlighting the migration that we often don't talk about, which is from the global north to the global south. Um, now, you are in, I'm going to open up the floor for questions and answers. Um, but before I do that, I'll ask a question. So I will give you time to reflect on what questions you might want to ask. And you are here speaking to a room which I would say is 90% filled with um, what shall I call you, young adults or bambuchoni or <laughs> young people who are maybe um, in waiting or in waithood, who knows. And my question then to you is, especially because um, you focused in your lecture on a lot of the um, negative consequences of waithood, but I know that in your books and in your analysis and in your uh, interviews that you did with young people, you also uh, very much highlighted the strategies and the alternative spaces that they were able to create. So what advice or what message can you give to young people um, who are sitting here and listening to you speak? Well, what can I say? You know, um, I don't think I have advice really, because what is interesting about this work with, uh, you know, young Africans that I've been doing through the research is really more listening and uh, and trying to understand their own experiences. And what I feel is that the young people sitting at, in this room also have their own experiences of what it means to be a young person at this point in time in the world with everything going around, uh, you know, around your lives. And the weighthood is something that is also related to your own location, to the way you experience it. And some of the things that I've been describing in this lecture and in my books, you know, some of you might see yourselves in it, some of you might not. Uh, but um, I really don't have any particular advice in terms of what you should do. And I presume that you, most of you in this room are graduate students, uh, you, you, you are uh, um, looking to finish your studies, and find a job. Some of you might succeed, others will not succeed. And then you would have to see what are the possibilities out there for me. But what I think the positive thing about weighthood is also in the difficulties that arise with this is that it forces one to find and to create and to invent and to imagine new ways of operating, new ways of creating uh, um, new businesses, new ideas, new partnerships, new connections, new ways of being in the world. And nothing of that is set. And especially now in this world when the possibilities are so, so many out there with uh, new ways of, uh, uh, new technologies of communication and information, new ways of uh, communicating in real time, of uh, getting to know other people's experience, of exchanging in real time. There are new things that are being created and, uh, and invented. So really, I don't have any particular advice. Do you have some, uh, maybe one example from your research on uh, African youth where you said, okay, these this group of youths are really uh, successful in creating some kind of alternative space? Yeah, that's what I said in my lecture. While I kind of just opposed just now when I talked about the young men and women who are selling goods in the streets. You have seen in many African capitals uh, that young men and women 
come to the streets and put their, go their, their goods in the pavement. And then comes the police and says, oh, the pavement is for people to circulate. Don't. And then when they see the police, the munici municipal police come, they have to run and find other place. Then they will turn the corner and go to another, but they don't cease to sell. And they might become what the Senegalese call les ambulants, those who carry the goods with them and they stop in between cars or they clean the mirror, the, the, the windshields, etc. But they always shy ways. They don't kind of uh, cross their hands and... Uh, and uh, but they are also the ones that become savvy entrepreneurs that create new companies, even in the informal market. And many go to the informal market because they don't have to pay taxes. They don't have to, you know, and they are uh, less formal uh, and structured. And some become very famous um, uh, entrepreneurs in terms of traveling the world, selling goods and bringing in. In Mozambique, there is this experience which is kind of liberating a lot of women, which is the experience of the muquerista. The muquerista is the young woman who initially would travel to South Africa after the fall of the apartheid. And South Africa had a lot of goods that Mozambique didn't have. And these young women would bribe the, the, the border officers to bring in goods without paying uh, um, the duty fees. And they would resell those goods. But more recently, when I was doing research in 2014, these young women, they're no longer going to South Africa. Now they became good, big entrepreneurs. Some of them are going to China, to Guangzhou and Shanghai, to Thailand, and bringing those goods, and they opened salons. They were, and I was interviewed a few young women, 15, 17, and I said, what do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be a muquerista, because a muquerista is really making it. So there are these uh, new ways. And there are others that are becoming savvy internet users because they want to connect to each other even though they don't have a computer at home. But in the internet cafe, they're there and they know, become hackers, become, you know, they are. And others repairing electronic devices. And young people have a way with technology, especially the internet, etc. And in Africa, everybody says, oh, ask a young person, he will tell you how to, how to fix your phone or how to send a message this way or another way. And there are also platforms like the Ushidi platform in Kenya, that it's a group of young people who were educated, but they didn't have uh, access, uh, access to, to uh, solid employment. And so they got together and they created these platforms that have excelled. And there are examples in Nigeria of very successful entrepreneurs that were born out of necessity because there were not jobs available to them. So in a way, I don't want to give the impression that it's all doom and gloom but it's also a period of opportunities, of being creative, of trying to uh, f create new boundaries, force boundaries, push the envelope in some way. Thank you. So let me uh, open the, to the floor if there are any questions and maybe we can collect a few. There's one back there. Hi, thank you very much for the interesting lecture. Um, you've talked a lot about um, the nature of work and its role that it plays in the fulfillment of adulthood. I'm still not super sure I'm an adult personally, but let's discuss that later. But you've also talked about the role that social protection about? and citizenship might play. Can you hear me at all? Or uh, they might play in this. Which is more important? We, we, we know that Bill Gates today made comments that uh, AI will inevitably replace the way that we work. Um, and we know that social protection is failing to keep up with the commands of the modern world. My colleague and I have just spent six weeks in a refugee camp in Kenya uh, looking at this very problem. We are completely failing in our attempt on humanitarian level social protection to deliver anything further than basic rights. What might be described as enabling the capability approach to half a million people in just one country. So, in your analysis and prognosis for the future, which comes first, chicken or egg? Do we focus on how we catch up our economies and the way they engage with young people 
um, thinking of problems like universal basic income to replace mass lost labor? Or do we focus first on reinventing social protection over enormous distances, and particularly in the African context with um, fairly mixed signals coming from the African Union on the role of uh, rights-based social protection across the continent in other than very few specific examples, uh, Monist South Africa, for example. So where do we start? So I didn't get, uh, I, I don't know if I got it right. So it's whether we start with uh, social protection or is that citizenship you mentioned? Well, at the moment, citizenship is construed, or social protection is construed by citizenship. Right. And despite fairly limited and uh, unimaginative examples by the international community, to move away from that, I'm thinking there's the Dakar Declaration in the African Union, the Windhoek Accord. These are particularly, uh, as we're discussing Africa, African contextual issues of right. transnational issues of social protection. But largely, when we look at the global picture, as soon as you cross that border, many of the, the, the citizenship-based rights dissolve away. And therefore, can we, or is it possible to, change the nature, what you've discussed, to, to bring these protections without right. completely and radically reimagining what citizenship and social protection mean together? And in that context, what does this mean for the mass uh, loss of labor through uh, AI, through automation? Uh, are these things um, se separable? Um, and where do we begin? Um, you've set us quite a challenge. Well, you know, I, I, I don't know, um, but my view would be that th they both necessary uh, in terms of, you know, because social protection, in a way, that's what I was talking about when I was talking about the, the, the upholding of the social contract between the state of, and citizen. And you need to get to a certain level of of, uh, of uh, development uh, in order to be able to afford people those kinds of protections. Um, but um, I, I don't think it's either one or the other. I don't know if that responds to your question, but I, 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 I don't know. I, I didn't think enough about that and I, I, that's all I could say at the moment, yeah. But I'm I also, I'm not sure I understood fully. We can then talk a little bit more. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah? Oh, sorry. Thank you. Um, so you say that um, the experience of some young Mozambicans of the immigration of Portuguese is that it increases their experience or their level of weighthood. Uh, how would you say that works the other way around? So how does the migration of young Africans to South Europe um, influence the experience of weighthood of young Southern Europeans? Um, I'd say not, we're gonna take, uh, we take a few. I would just like if you could um, say a bit more about the Portuguese going to, to Mozambique and you said something about the, the local nationals feeling crowded out by these um, economic migrants. My question though is, is there evidence to say that there is crowding out and what are the developmental effects that are, are coming from these, these economic migrants that actually might be in their work creating new jobs for locals. Um, is there evidence of that, or can you speak to that? Thanks. OK, these are two yes. related questions. Yes. Yeah. One is, well, in, in, the, in the case of um, the Portuguese exacerbating weighthood in Mozambique, it's mainly amongst the Mozambique graduates who could do some of these high, you know, jobs that required high levels of uh, education that these Portuguese companies would prefer to hire the Portuguese and even try to bypass local laws rather than the Mozambicans. So in a way, in scale, you know, it's, it's a small fraction because weighthood is much greater than the young graduates. 
but it's a reaction of the graduates in relation to that, because if those Portuguese were not going there in such a high numbers, they would have at least to hire local Mozambicans. And the Portuguese come with incentives and protections that make the companies to prefer them, because first they get them for free for six months, so they have a chance to test them and do a kind of free test run. And, um, and on the other hand, uh, they don't have to follow all the rules uh, in terms of having to hire the number of Mozambicans because then they hire the Portuguese as private companies rather than employees. And there are things about uh, uh, all, the, all the financial um, fees or whatever that companies in terms of capital have to deal in the countries that it's easier if they're just foreigners. But how, on the other hand, of, of the other way around, the um, Africans coming to Europe might be exacerbating way it would in Europe. I think it's slightly different because in a sense, I don't think that way it would in Europe is at the level of non-educated, the kind of massive migrants that you receive, the ones that end up in Lampedusa or anywhere else. But there are also the migration of Africans into Europe that are taking high-level jobs. And probably I am an example of that. I'm a young, I, I was a young African educated in Africa and in Europe. Then I stayed in the West and I'm working here. But it's a much restricted uh, uh, group. The bulk of those who come, I don't think they threaten the type of weighthood experience that you're having here. I think the problem of migration in Europe is not about the weighthood of young Europeans, but broader issues about uh, uh, how society copes with uh, migrant populations, whether they're here temporarily, they're here to stay, and what kinds of new adjustments to uh, society and the economy already have to, but I don't think it's a kind of a direct track to youth to youth. At least uh, I, I, I don't see it that way. But having said that, I haven't done specific research on looking at European weighthood in that sense to be able to give you a kind of conclusive answer. It's just uh, what uh, I kind of think about uh, right now. Um, your other question was about whether the, the Portuguese migrants in Mozambique in the long run are creating more opportunities for young Mozambicans. Or just what are the economic development effects from having Portuguese investment and highly skilled Portuguese? Yeah, I understand I, the crowding out of graduates, it, but is there evidence to suggest that it's, because on the one hand, I mean, it's just the idea of, 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 you know, take the US for example now where people are very anti-immigrant and it's partly they say, oh, well, they're taking our jobs, but the evidence is, same thing with Europe, that they're, they aren't taking people's jobs. Right. I mean, yeah, I think on maybe an individual level for some people that's yeah. the case, but. I don't think, yeah. Um, I don't think there has been any studies of the impact of uh, this Portuguese migration, especially youth migration into Mozambique. Maybe some kind of more economic analysis in terms of uh, financial investments of Portuguese companies in the banking industry and um, uh, kind of larger companies, but kind of a small entrepreneurship uh, by individual um, uh, groups. I don't think there is any known analysis of what the impact is. And in terms of these young graduates, I don't think there is any visible, and it cannot be evaluated because it's a trend that started in the uh, 2010, maybe 2009, the bulk of it was 2011. Um, and these are in experience of the university graduates who are also cutting their teeth there. So I don't think that they're making such a great uh, uh, 
uh, impact right now. But in a few years, who knows? But also it has to be said that um, with some kind of political instability, um, that trend reduced because there were some tensions between uh, the government and the opposition. They never, it was not an onset of war, but there were threats and there were sporadic uh, attacks and, uh, and uh, um, situations of insecurity that threatened. And also there was some crisis with uh, kidnappings of uh, uh, foreigners, etc. that uh, uh, kind of uh, refrained a bit the trend. But it continues, maybe in a lesser, uh, in a smaller pace, but it would be something uh, interesting to, to, to look at in a few years and see what is the impact. Great, thanks. Already two very interesting thesis topics have been identified. <laughs> um, one, to be looking at weighthood in southern Europe and uh, seeing how maybe the youth in Lampedusa are experiencing weighthood. And another is to be looking more in uh, maybe in Mozambique or these other places in terms of the impact of uh, north to south migration. Um, I saw another question here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I would like to know what do you think about the role um, South South cooperation can play in this? Uh, yeah, these problems that not. Um, not only within the African continent, but between countries that uh, in America or, I mean, the American continent and uh, Asia as well, for example, to deal with weighthood? Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, I think, um, I think it's hard to say that it's particular cooperation to deal with weighthood because weighthood is not something that can be seen in isolation from larger societal pro uh, processes. Weight wood is a reflection of lack of economic growth, development, uh, um, uh, political freedoms, uh, socially, social justice, et cetera, et cetera. So when people feel uh, marginalized, because weight wood is not just about having a job, but a sense of fulfillment that you get where you are uh, uh, in terms of uh, the space you have to do things and the availability of resources, both material, social, cultural, etc., for you to, to do things. So I think South-South cooperation that would enhance sustainable development, more democratic uh, practices, uh, fair trade, better exchanges, etc., will be conducive to creating better jobs for the younger generation, would be conducive to create space for uh, uh, divergent views, opinions, and uh, possibilities of engagement uh, with the state, for reinforcing the social contract between state and citizens, etc. But I think, yes, South-South cooperation would be. And I know uh, there is also the other uh, areas of uh, partnership that African countries have been developed, not just with Europe, but there are relationships with China, relationships with America, et cetera. And I think this all helps. I think it boils down to a broader uh, systemic uh, uh, change within what's going on in the continent. Because I think, in a way, weighthood is a symptom of something broader that it's not aligned and working well. Um, when you refer to weighthood, it seems to me that you mainly refer to a state where um, people are very unsure about what to do, where to go, and, and how, like have no, no safe space to stay for a longer while. Um, now I could see the same applying to, to older people um, when the job market changes or the economy changes and that people who have been have an, maybe an established family or something um, that, that they um, get fired or that the status or the surroundings they've stayed in changes and that they're in a very similar situation of not really knowing um, who they are, how they, 
how they should, uh, how they sh what, what they're going to do within the next 10, 20 years. Um, do you have experience or comparisons between those young people in this rateout and maybe older people being in a very similar state? Um, yeah, thank you. Um, my question is not so much related to weighthood itself, but to another um, um, issue or topic you touched upon. Um, you you described the innovation and the the improvised survivalist strategies a lot of people pursue, and the precarious um, forms of yeah of work where street vendors um, make a living, etc. Um, and yeah, in a way, you saw it and you consider the positive thing, the, the immense of, or the amount of innovation and the positive um, yeah, energy, let's say, that comes out of it. On the other hand, um, you were also in favor of, uh, or you um, advertised, let's say, increasing investment from, for example, the European Union or from Europe into um, African countries and communities. Um, but I think from what we've learned in the past is that investment always required um, increasing regulation and uh, preconditions, um, more legal stability, etc. And uh, to me, it seems that those two things don't really go well together. So often it happened that um, those innovative and improvised forms of livelihoods were pushed out with the increasing demand of stability and regulation, which was demanded by investment, especially from, uh, for example, Western countries or like the global north countries to the global south. So do you think? Um, the preconditions and the requirements um, investors from developed countries have <clears throat> should change so that uh, we can basically benefit from both, from the innovation, but also from the, the capital we have in the north? Or will it indeed be an inevitable outcome in the long run that once we have developed economies in Africa that those um, livelihood forms or those survivalist strategies and uh, improvised livelihoods will just disappear. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I'll start with the last, which is fresh in my head. Um, I don't think it's an either or, because if you look at societies in the West, you have both regulation and you have both innovation. And uh, you can combine the two. The fact that there is that space, it's a space to be cherished and encourage people to continue to use that space. But I don't think that space alone is sufficient to take Africa out of where it is. You need a combination of strategies. And of course, African governments and African countries will continue to reach out to partnerships with the other parts and the richer parts of the world and trying to see that you know, this is what we have. We have raw materials, but we need better education. We need better investment in agriculture. We need to kind of, we have a lot of land, but we need to learn how to use our land to produce more food. Maybe we have a lot of uh, uh, forests here and uh, we need to see how that can wall, help the world balance issues of climate change. So there are those kinds of investments. And when I talk about investment, it's not just about profit making and those regulations that tie or are less conducive to people's empowerment, but investments that also contribute to empower people that to, to bring in knowledge, uh, I think it's necessary. So I think the bo both of them don't exclude uh, uh, each other. And in terms of weighthood and all the people, well, weighthood in a sense, it's not just about the fact that you're struggling or that at some point you find some difficulty. Because in that sense, you know, throughout history, you know, people have struggled in different moments of their lives. And the concept of weighthood in this particular uh, moment in time is that because the world has such a huge young population, and that in, those, in this particular point in time, that young population is not making you know, a, a, a transition or kind of a, their identity is no longer the identity of being a young person, and then you gain the identity of being an employed person or a married person, or, uh, or uh, uh, 
a, a taxpayer or whatever other identities you create, you become in a situation of limbo in which you feel that you haven't gotten there yet. But the thing is that for the majority, the light is not even there in the end of the tunnel. That waiting is becoming prolonged. And so it's not that you know you finish your graduation and you can become a worker. You are immediately attached to a job or you are, you say, I can leave my parents' home and get a home of my own. You don't have those means. And we, we are living in societies that are more kind of structured around individualized uh, 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 experiences of uh, you making it on your own and getting your own successful story, so to speak. And if people are not achieving that uh, 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 personally, it is a sense that they haven't kind of reached that point. And so that is the search. And um, it's not just my interpretation of it, but it's my reading of what young men would say and women would say to me when they would say, je me débrouille, I try to make it. I'm just getting by. It means that, you know, you're waiting for something else. And it's in that, it's that idea that it's tried to be captured with the experience of waithood. And it's becoming so prolonged that you get to the point of the youth man, who chronologically should not be seen as a youth, but you know, in social terms, his behavior and his status or his or her status in society is still the status of a young person because that person has no means to be a provider to others. And as I said, being able to provide in many cultures, in many societies, is what defines adulthood and the responsibility of taking care of others, of contributing to society, of having a job and paying your taxes, etc., etc. So not many people are able to do that. Okay, uh, Professor Hunwana, I want to close now this session, given the time. Um, and I want to let everyone in the room know that there's going to be drinks at the end of the room, and you're all welcome. Um, but before we go, I want to thank you, especially for having come all the way from the US to give this Kapuscinski lecture. I think um, one thing, we had a workshop this, this early this afternoon with some PhD students and postdocs. And one thing that we mentioned there was also how inspiring it is to see someone who has gone from an academic position and uh, an anthropology and ethnographer who has been in the field for many years um, collecting stories of young people and then having made this at least temporary switch in career and working for the United Nations and then really you know, getting your hands dirty so that you're not only theorizing but then you're also trying to apply things and you mentioned to us about a project that you're currently involved in working with uh, youth groups in Togo and trying to think and, and work together with them on how best to mobilize their energies and their ideas so as to make a political impact in Togo. And I think this can be very inspiring also to uh, the students and, and scholars here, uh, how you combine the two. So once again, thank you very much. <laughs>